I like to call the meeting the order. That means the roll call. Stevie Dundas, present. John Nomo, present. Stevie Minor, here. here. Lindsay Dustin, present. Jeff McCann, present. Okay. So just with similar to what we did with the last couple of meetings, there hasn't been a chairperson who's been appointed. Um, yet this board has to designate a chairperson for tonight's meeting only. I'm getting confused about what. Um, so for tonight's meeting, we would do the same thing. Somebody would make a motion to appoint a chairperson for tonight's meeting only, then a second, and then. Um, so the motion so I can John and the second be and then show of hands if you're following the paper. Wouldn't you worry about everybody else? <laughs> 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 I sent it to you, yes, that's fine. Um, okay, so John will be our chair first. And Stephen will have to do a question. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you would, I'll open the meeting, please stand. We'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, and the name of the nation. Thank you all. The first item is an administrative item. Can I have a motion from the board, please, regarding adopting the meeting minutes from the March 6th meeting? I'll make that. Jack, Jack has made the motion. Can we have a second, please? I'll second. Stephen has a second the motion. All those in favor of adopting the meeting minutes as they've been presented to us, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you all. The meeting minutes have been adopted. <clears throat> Pardon me. So first we have one item of old business, PLZBA 2024-0005. This is an application for a use variance. The applicant is Center Line Communications on behalf of AT&T. Is the applicant here this evening? Good evening. If you don't mind, please, for the record, could you speak into the microphone, please? I appreciate it. Please identify yourself. My name is Sonia Blanc Lewis. I'm with Ted. Do you want an address or just Center Line Communications? I think that's fine. That's, so. that's from board. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, there, there was a discussion, a brief discussion of the proposal at the last meeting. And we were provided some materials uh, regarding your application. Uh, the materials were provided by your council. In the interim, the city's council has provided the board with uh, additional materials about the, uh, the laws covering, and I believe it's federal laws covering uh, the zo a zoning board's review of a utilities application for a uh, variance, correct? Um, I have to ask our council, if, if you don't mind, please, I need some clarification before we move forward. Um, in the materials, uh, I'm, I'm borrowing words, uh, it says the, the utility has to show a need the facilities 
Okay. Does the need have to be particular to that utility? Because we're talking about cell, a cell phone tower. Right. So what that essentially means is a gap in coverage. Uh, is that a gap in, in this case, it's for cell phone coverage. Is that a gap just for this carrier? Because there are multiple carriers? Right. So you can't discriminate against carriers. So the argument like, oh, well, you know, AT&T doesn't have coverage in this area, but Verizon does. So I'm going to go get Verizon's resident here. That's not a legal basis for which to deny the application. So when you're just when we're discussing gap in coverage and the need for this particular um, antenna facility site, um, what have you, you look specific to the carrier you can compare with other carriers. Okay, thank you. So I'm oh, sorry for the for the interruption, the sidetrack. But if you would please, can you speak to AT and T's coverage? In the area that we're talking about? Yeah, the area in particular, we're trying to, to include the coverage. They do have coverage yet, and it's also going to be the coverage and the site where they need to offload coverage to an existing site at RPI. And this is this, um, the line of sight between 500 Federal Street and the RPI site. So we're, well, there's two solutions that this is going to um, provide. You know, really important. Okay. So it's a situation there is some coverage this is going to improve it would would your coverage be improved by either updating or leaving the equipment in place that's at rpi the, the equipment at rpi is going to stay the, it's overloaded it's it's it at its capacity so they have to offload some of the data that goes to that site to another site. Okay. That's the purpose of one of the purposes of this location. Thank you. Uh, in, in my head, I thought the, the equipment at RPI was was being decommissioned, no, I but it, it's going to remain. Okay. Thank you. At this point, it's okay. I'm going to throw it open to the rest of the board. If anyone else has any questions. Regarding the application, yes, um, tied to John's point, and uh, um, based on council's uh, clarification of the standard of substantial evidence, so you're referring to uh, an overloading situation at RPI being a primary cause. Well, that is one of the reasons for the, the, the solution for the issues that AT and T has in the area. So the gap and the being overloaded at RPI. Correct. Um, you gave various options um, in your materials at different locations. So talking about AT and T, um, but in terms of providing substantial evidence, uh, uh, comparing and showing why the selection was made and requiring or asking for uh, use variance today of that one option, I, I didn't, I haven't seen um, details sufficient to uh, support substantial evidence of uh, why that one location would uh, rectify the overloading situation and the gap situation. Can you provide that? I mean, the, the ideal location is 500 Federal Street because it does have a direct line of sight between RPI and, and 500 Federal Street. So that is the primary, you know, reason and logic um, evidence from the R material. Why they chose this location rather than, say, the Kennedy Towers, because that's a little bit too far away. So, you know, they, have, they just couldn't get the, the same amount of coverage at that location as they can for 500 Federal Street. This will provide better, you know, improved coverage to West Employee, in addition to re relieving the capacity issue that they have at RPI. And it says, you know, the location is kind of dictated by that existing site. So how does um, distance and direct site, if you could provide some clarification on, on those components, how do they kind of factor in in focusing on this option? I mean, the decision is made by ARA. I mean, when we go to a to each you know, location, they give us an idea of like, you know, whether or not it's going to provide the coverage that they need, you know, achieve the, the objective that they're going to have. 
every, every all the evidence that they had in front of them, the 500 bedroom three building provides the best solution um, for relief at the RPI site and additional coverage and include coverage in Western Korea. And now you're saying presented to them, presented to who to, to centralize to the final uh, by AT&T RPG. Would uh, AT&T uh, be willing to share uh, that, that? Well, they kind of do with their propagation maps. So in the packet that we provided uh, with our application, there was an RF justification report, and then there were propagation maps. Um, they're colored maps that shows you what the coverage is with, with and without the, you know, at each site, and then in particular, how the site at 500 Federal Street would be improved by installing the antenna at that location. Well, that's kind of a before and after situation. Uh, but, you know, when you're talking about distance, uh, you know, how does distance, you know, not even referring to a, a, an equation, but uh, does distance, how does distance weaken a signal? I mean, a, a signal can only travel so far. Um, I know if you were building a tower, the, the, the area that the tower would cover is actually five miles, it's probably more like two and a half to three miles. And the further away from the tower that you get, the weaker the signal is. So, so, you know, I'm not sure the exact distance between 500 federal and RPI, but it's, it's close enough and yet far enough away where the coverage is going to be able to offload the signal coming from RPI. It basically will pick up that and then can transmit it out. And then it will also include coverage and provide additional coverage to Western Florida that 18 customers currently aren't able to get. And it's also first responders. Uh, See, that's, for that's, that's, that's what I'm, I'm getting at. I would like to, you know, have a comparison of, you know, X distance versus Y distance. Okay, it's stronger, but it's shorter. Uh, uh, direct line of sight um, goes fully straight, whereas here goes, you know, uh, in one direction and changes twice. <laughs> and then, hey, can you provide any comparison among those options? I, I don't have anything other than, you know, what the, our engineer has provided us as far as the propagation map. So I don't have anything additional than that. Um, I don't know if they base it on, on so much on distance um, per se, but signal strength. Well, you, you, you said yourself signal strength is yeah. based on this. So it says, but I don't know the exact distance. I mean, I'm not going to do this, I personally don't know what that is. I you know if it's covered in the in the RF plot, the RF justification. Um, I don't think they specify distance, but they do show you location and what the, you know, with the antenna. This is, you know, this is what the coverage area is going to look like. Without it, it's so much, you know, there's a lot of uh, gaps in coverage. So I'm just trying to uh, gather uh, substantial evidence to make a decision. That's, that's all. Um, I really, I mean, what additional evidence, um, what, what kind of report or additional evidence are you looking for? Well, as I indicated to you, you're, you're talking about two components, distance and direct line of sight. You have several options mm -hmm. that you present, and apparently, the, the, and, and map, general map. Yeah. Looks very good, but it doesn't focus on those two factors that you refer to. And it would be useful, for my purposes, and I think yours purposes in whole, to compare, okay, generally. You know, there's a distance of X or Y for these components. The direct line of sight changes <clears throat> two times, three times for these other options. It only changes once. Uh, not overly detailed. It's not requiring a monthly report. It's, it's very general. But uh, I, to me, that would be useful. Mr. Chairman, oh, well, just a direct line of sight. This is also a competitive market <laughs> where you need to be here. Okay? I've received quite a few phone calls of people live on the west of Florida, so I don't have no coverage. Okay? This is going to improve that, right? So, 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 yeah. so why how much? Just 
ballpark. I don't know what the percentage would be. I just I know from, from looking at the, the our application map that it will significantly improve the coverage in this area for eight point two customers. Um, that location is just a prime location in central to where they need to be to to you know have the greatest amount of bank for the bus or the site there then you don't need the test site something else maybe later on down the road. So you're reading your technicians deem this to be the, the yeah. one spot yeah. that this would work. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have you any other questions from the board? Okay. Um, start with is there anyone here in the room i'm sorry uh, for now uh, we'll, we'll throw it open to questions from the public and then if, if there's anyone who speaks against the proposal you'll have the opportunity to answer those issues all right thank you okay apologies is there anyone here in the room that would like to speak in favor of the application. Okay. Um, Angie, can the folks that are online participate? Okay. Is is there anyone um, participating remotely in the meeting that would like to speak in favor of the application? Okay, moving on. Is there anyone here in the room this evening that would like to speak against the application? And finally, is there anyone here, uh, I'm sorry, is there anyone participating remotely that would like to speak against the application? Okay. At this point, um, I another issue, uh, a little uncomfortable because I'm, I'm working inside as best I can our code, but more importantly, you've been instructed to pay closer attention to uh, federal law. Now, uh, can you just speak to the aesthetics of, of, of what you're proposing? Is there any way to mitigate that, to move the equipment back from the edge of the building, so it's it's out of sight from the uh, from ground level. We considered that, but the, the further back you go on the rooftop, because the higher you have to have things, and there's a there's a parapet you have to overcome. So then you have issues of things kind of sticking way up, and then wind smoking and that. The closer we can be to the edge, the, the less. You know, it's actually left more, and then these will kind of blend in as far as helping with the existing HVAC unit on the on the building, so it will almost blend in with the same color. Okay, thank you. Okay, again, are there any questions or issues to be raised by the board? At this point, I think. I'm going to close the discussion on the application and move forward to the CEPRA. I don't recall that it was in regard to the PL ZBA 2024-0005, as supported by the staff reports, I ask that the board find this proposal to be an unlisted seeker action with sufficient information available. Okay, would another member of the board like to uh, second? I would second it. Yeah, second, and so, uh, all those in favor of, of adopting CEPRA, uh, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Please say no. Okay. In that case, we've uh, got our secret. And now I'm going to ask one of the members of the board if anyone would like to make a motion in regards to the requested variance PLZBA 2024-0005. I will make a motion on uh, that we approve the use variance. Um, I will go through the tenants, but uh, my understanding is that as a wireless communication facility, they don't exactly apply. So how would we go about doing that? Um, I, I don't believe this is a hardship. I mean, yeah, so the factors, so the factors um, essentially as set forth in the memo that this board can consider is whether there's an actual need for the antenna, which we discussed with respect to the coverage. Um, I don't know that it was necessarily addressed out, out loud, but it may have been addressed in your packets with respect to the possibility of co-location and any site um, that already exists. And just that uh, the aesthetics of it. I know it's that that too. You can consider that to a minimal degree. It's not necessarily a basis for total denial that there could be conditions that were So you would just essentially, when you make your motion, which I know you are getting but it's part of that, and the board would just address those three criteria and whether or not you would feel that there needs to be a condition. So I would propose I withdraw my motion and we can, as a board, discuss mm -hmm. those various different elements that we can consider. I mean, you can keep the motion on the table and have the discussion on the motion. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Let's do that. Um, all right. So I propose motion to approve the variance as it is. Um, I think the applicant has made the case that um, uh, this is the appropriate location for this site um, without a significant impact on, you know, this whole assessment of the neighborhood um, and agree with the location of a shorter height closer to the base of the I'll second that. I, I agree. Uh, so I'm out of my comfort zone uh, discussing a, a variance involving a, a utility, but I think it's been shown based on the discussions this evening, the discussions at last meeting, and, and materials provided. I still maintain uh, a view that uh, the use variance has not been supported by substantial evidence based on the factors explained uh, or presented today and last week. And so, if there's no further discussion, you can take a vote. It seems that there is no further discussion. We had a motion, but we haven't had a second. I would say, I say, I second it. Sorry. <laughs> I miss you exactly. So. <laughs> I know. Okay, uh, Angie, if you don't mind, could you call the roll and the board and the voting board? Voting on the motion. On the motion to approve the variance as it is, I'm going to make a motion to approve the variance. Give me down the board. No. So, normal? I vote yes to approve. Stephen Minor? Yes, to approve. Clayton Destin? Yes, to approve. Jeff McCann? Yes, to approve. Okay. Um, as you've seen, uh, you granted your variance. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. You're driving back to her. Please be careful. Mm -hmm. I hope you have a safe travel. Thank you very much. Road are getting bad. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Try to move this along. Okay, at this point, we're going to move on to the uh, first application under new business. We are going to discuss 
PL CBA 20240014. This is a request for a use variance. The applicant is Mr. Andrew Donovan. Donovan, you're present. Good evening. Good evening. If you don't mind, could you identify yourself, please? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I call that microphone or do I need a microphone? My name is Andrew Donovan uh, with the engineering firm Andrew J. Donovan, PPC. I'm representing the owners of 2412 15th Street in this very request. Uh, thank you. If you would, can you describe the project? Sure. Thank you. So the project that we have is um, a building that has a history as a commercial building. Um, as of almost a couple of days short of a year of it, this would have been a conforming use um, in, in the old Hoosick Commerce District. Um, unfortunately, and for various reasons, the building is one big for seven years. And the owner now has two tenants that would like to occupy this building and I'll say continued use. And I know there's a discontinued use, but continued use in this commercial building. Um, when it was, when the area was rezoned last year under the new chapter 285, um, the, this parcel was placed in the resident, in a residential use zone. And so, in order to be able to reoccupy this commercially for requesting these areas. Do any members of the board have any questions for the applicant? Please go ahead. Um with this our uh with the reuse of the site. Um, as commercial, are there any additional planned improvements? The only improvements we're going to make is to the uh, hard paved area out right now. It's a general pull off of 15th Street. Um, and we understand that the next step for us is to go to the Bureau of Code Enforcement for the building permit, which at that point will generate conversation with the planning department. Um, we're going to propose to recreate the sidewalk along 15th Street, as well as create a, a single curb cut into this, the front of this building to better control traffic flow in and out. Do you have any preliminary plans of what that might look like? I do not at this time. Um, the conversation, I had a conversation with, with planning Mm -hmm. um, and the general opinion was, how about we wait to get past this point um, and then determine what level of, uh, what, again, we're anticipating planning commission, but it's not guaranteed. <laughs> um, so we're, that, that was the general gist of it was, don't go too far just yet. Let's talk about the, the zoning use areas and then start to put together plans for Parking area. So, you are anticipating needing site plan um, approval from the planning commission. In preliminary conversations, there is some exception, and I I won't claim to know exactly where that exception is going to come from. But the way it was explained was that, given what's already there, that it may be there may be discussion to take place with. Bureau of Code Enforcement that um, won't require planning commission approval. That being said, we, I personally, would be uh, initially was anticipating that as part of the process. So we would just take whatever you know, whatever recommendations signals moving forward. So I guess I'm going to take it over to see you guys if you. <laughs> Yeah, there's been a lot of different discussions back and forth. Um, this is a unique situation because the property existed in commercial form and under the old code, which I know is um, 
it's relevant here for purposes of actually considering use variance criteria, but under the old code, um, this would have been allowed with a full use and it would have gone to site plan review. Now with the new code, it does, it's not an allowable use, that's why we're here, and it, there would not typically be um, site plan approval required for the property of this size. Um, internally, I know that there was some discussion on this going to the planning commission given the, the length of time in which it has been vacant, um, needing to get brought up to code in some aspects. I know that there was a report um, sent out that indicated the sidewalk and drive entrances, repaving the surface parking area, installing new curb and providing additional green space for all factors that planning department um, had kind of flagged as important aspects of this review, either as a condition um, in some form or nature. So what had been suggested was maybe that this board actually do a site visit and make those determinations as a, you know, as members of this board condition on any approval. But this it's within this board's prerogative as to how you want to handle it. You can make conditions. Um, you could either table it and do the site plan visit and make the recommendations yourself, specific recommendations. You can make recommendations um, based on the factors that are here, but make it contingent upon approval of the planning department. If the applicant is willing to do some type of minor site plan approval with the planning commission and he's in agreement on that, then that could also be a resolution to get it done at the versus putting it out. So that's how I see the three options available. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's my understanding that the use variance can only be contingent upon things that are directly related to the use, not necessarily overall site aspects. Correct. Um, but the preference would be, I think, if it gets to site, you know, the, my preference would be, I guess, the word would be that the planning commission conducts site plan reviews like they normally do. And, and that was my conversation. I mean, just for transparency purposes, my conversation with the planning department was that that's what they're trained to do whereas this board doesn't have as much experience in those aspects of it um so i was a little bit uncomfortable having this board do the site plan or do the site visit and make the recommendations um so i mean in my opinion my legal opinion the easy forward would be to uh, if the applicant is willing to have it go to the planning commission for review it doesn't necessarily have to be as intensive review as usual, but um, there should be some type of review that addresses these things. And I mean, it is relevant to the use in that, you know, if it's becoming a commercial property again, then we need to make sure that it's code compliant in all aspects as members of the public will be. Yeah, and I think on the property. a lot of things that have come up are directly related to being code compliant, you know, in driveways, like a city with sidewalk, um, parking would have to be four feet outside the pedestrian space there's <laughs> the little nuances. Um I think there is potentially um just reviewing the code and it's a little bit up to interpretation um that if uh five five or more parking spaces were to be proposed as part of a new commercial development, then that may trigger site plan review. So that in itself of kind of approving this new use because that's really what it is, uh, this experience. Um, there, there may be an interpretation in the code regarding the number of parking spaces that are being provided. Um, that would trigger that. So I guess I'm going to take it back to you. How many parking spaces are you planning? <laughs> Once again, we haven't, I haven't begun the, the code review, the site plan review myself. Um, I've got some general dimensions of the parking area, and it, it really was just let's let's get this process. Um, if if planning commission is or site plan review is the answer, and by all means we're going to be able to, we're going to pull together what we need to do. We know that this is not the end of the game. Uh, we know that 
we're going to have to have some review by planning. We know that we've got a building permit to, to have done. So that's why we're here tonight was to hopefully get us back on the books as a commercial, as a commercial use for the proposed uses and then go to work on the site plan and the building plans. I don't have any other questions. Let me see. Yeah, a couple of quick questions. How long has that building been vacant? Uh, approximately five years. So for the last five years, it hasn't been occupied for use commercial. Correct. It's been vacant. Yes. Has the ownership of the building changed? I went there today. I saw it for sale. Sorry. Yeah, no ownership has not changed. Uh, it's been the same ownership for 11 or 12 years. It's been a lot. Same ownership for 11 or 12 years. But it is for sale. Uh, if I might, I have Miss Yan Wong here from, uh, saw her picture on the on the sign. I can ask her if you would like. It's fun. I'm done. Hi. Hello, my name is Yogi and I'll speak into the microphone. Hi, good evening. My name is Yan Wang. I'm uh, the landlord um, agent. So now this uh, property is the full lease for rent. Uh, during the past five years, it's never been uh, listed as a selling. So the building is not for sale, it's for rent. Yes, my sign is uh, on, on the property now since um, I think two months ago. Yes. Can we go back to the parking lot for a minute? Sure. If that became commercially zoned or used or approved, you'd have to strike the parking spots as opposed to just black topping and not striking. Is that correct? Correct. So you have no idea how many cars you could accommodate. We know that the Parking the paved area, um, it's almost the entire width of the property. So it's 100, 100 feet, and we've got approximately 30 foot depth from um, from 15th Street to now. We know that we've got to take into account sidewalks and so forth. Right. But uh, so no, I have not done a calculation um, of, for example, traffic pattern in and out. I haven't looked at any of that yet. Um, that was going to be. Um, site planning. planning. Has code been through this building since it's been vacant for so long? Not to my knowledge. So code has not been through it. It's been vacant for about five years. All right. Thank you. Right. Mr. Chair. Go right ahead. Sounds to me like we have possibility to make payment. Is that correct, Councilor? I, I do. It depends a lot of stuff that hasn't been presented. Right. It depends on the position that this board takes. So if this board takes the position that you have enough information to decide the four factors that form in a use variance decision. Um, then you could move forward and make conditions on, if it were to be an approval, you could make conditions that um, the building become code compliant. And if the applicant's willing to agree to go to the planning commission for site plan review, um, or if this board wants to make a determination on certain site plan factors that were put forward by the planning department, then you can table it to be able to look into those issues and make specific recommendations. I'd like to make a motion table this until we have more facts. I mean, to me, it sounds like we still have the requirement that we got to approach my name. And it sounds to me like it was just a fact that we have to fight to me. So, well, in my opinion, I just think we should table this for now until we can put more uh, information about how this is going to go with planning. So, well, right now it's not going to the planning commission unless 
that the greed as a result of the granting of a variance that it will go to planning. So it's not going to go to planning and come back here different with more information in a month. And then with respect to any code, code doesn't have the ability to just go in right now, but once they're approval on their building permits issue, then there will be, they will have the ability to do it. So it's actually not, we're not ahead of ourselves here because the things that you're discussing, we can't even get to until we decide mm -hmm. how this is going to go. Ultimately, we're deciding what path this right. state's going to go to. Are we going to conduct a site plan review for the conditions, conditions upon the use variance? Are we going to approve the use variance um, on the contingency that they get site plan approval from the planning commission? All code is they would need for the building permit, or we're saying, yes, we're going to approve the use variance and we're going to rely solely on code when they get the building permit um, and our recommendation in order to enforce these things that I think we all agree we're looking for. Um, are those, or we deny the use variance. Those were four options, I think, the four paths forward. Um, well, I'm comfortable doing a, a site plan review. I think I've got the, the expertise. Um, I think as a vote, a board, we should not be conducting a site plan review and leaving it up to the planning commission to do that um, and relaying our concerns or you know things we'd like them to consider in site plan review going forward. Um, and I think they should go through that very public process. Um, if it, we just leave it to code, then it is a very private process as opposed to a public transparent process where a site plan is put forth before the public. Um, I think that from a use variant standpoint, this has been commercial in the past. Um, it's the border between um, residential and commercial use on Music Street. So I think. I think that it makes sense to uh, approve the use variants, but make sure that that transition, the pedestrian cave, et cetera, is um, accounted for in development of the site. I want to continue the discussion. Yeah. Uh, Jack, you made a motion mm -hmm. to table. It, it sounds to me like the your, your motion to table was uh, to table it to give um, planning and planning the chance to do a site plan for you, but I think council pointed out that's not possible. Not at this juncture. At this juncture. So we still have a motion on the table. I'll withdraw the motion. Okay. Um, then we'll continue our discussion. Go ahead. I would still like to know if we approve this process, we're still going to get our information code and still going to get our information from planning, correct? Right? I mean, I saw what we had. When you say we are still going to get our information, I guess, do you mean we <laughs> have a zoning board? Yeah. <laughs> if we move this book. If you move this forward and approve the use variance, then it's not going to come back to this board. It's going to go to planning next and code so to do their thing. Right. It would be conditioned, right. assuming. I would draw the board. But it would be a condition of the approval as I think right. to do those things to satisfy your. We sure. could approve the use variance contingent. Right. Right. Upon a site plan and so coming into code to be code compliant, and I think I mean I I keep saying this, but you're so you're in agreement that that we and, and that was always my planning. that was always my that was my path forward was that once we get past this step, the drawings get completed, we submit to Bureau of Code Enforcement for the permit, um, given site conditions, it would then get kicked over to planning, um, and I anticipated the planning planning commission review for this, for the bit of the site. You haven't had a chance to speak. Views have already been expressed by others. Okay. 
So again, I just before we get to a point of motion, I just it's in the on page the bottom of page three of the um <laughs> report, but it goes it lists the four use variance criteria to when either grant or deny or grant with conditions if you could please go through each of the criteria and explain either how the applicant has or has not met those criteria. Thank you. I have, I have a couple of questions about the problem. Have you, have you been through the building? I have. Okay. Can you uh, can you speak to what it would take to to turn this property, including the building and and the lot? Talk about what resources would be required to turn this back into a uh, a residence that would fit within the zone. This is a, I'm sorry. Single family. What's that? Single family. A single family zone. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'll start with the interior of the building. Uh, the building itself, as with a lot of commercial use, there's been modifications, alterations made inside, moving partitions. Um, changing some the bathroom aspects that in order to bring it back to the to a residential use um there would be a, a certain amount of demolition within the building and a certain amount of reconstruction recreating partition walls um making sure that the, the bathroom facilities um are full bathroom facilities but then the other thing that has happened over in, in the past is that um there is no longer a working kitchen in the building. So in order to construct and recreate um, the kitchen, we're, we're in the tens of thousands of dollars in just doing the interior renovations. To the exterior of the building, um, again, we've got about 3,000 square feet of hardscape paved area that in order to take that up, the pavement, the subgrade, then come back in and prepare that those surfaces for for green space for grass and landscaping. Um, somewhere in that again, those tens of thousands of dollars. And I and my numbers are back there, but I think I I think I I when when we looked at this, um, we're thinking somewhere in probably that seventy thousand dollars, seventy eighty thousand dollar range. Um, the owner has no intention to live there. And I think in my documents, I noted uh, the value of the building as a commercial building and the value of the residential building. If we take the value as a residential building you know, and then deduct the costs involved, um, the economic hardship falls in that there is, the owner would not get their value back for that property if they were to bring it back to the uh, Truly a single family home. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's instructive for people who are attending the meeting. Okay. 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 I, have, I have actually, based on uh, John's uh, um, conversation with you, um, the proposal now is to make two uses a takeout restaurant and a spa. Now you already talked about from a residential standpoint, <laughs> uh, a lot of investment uh, uh, requires reconstruction of a working kitchen. Well, yes. for a restaurant, you're going to need a kitchen. And also, I, I don't know how that meshes with the cost involved to split for two very different uses, uh, take a restaurant and a spa. So how does that compare investment needed to make it residential? In the uh, with, within the building, there there is um, there is a partition that runs front to back through the building that both tenants have agreed that that divides the building sufficiently for them. So we have, we'll have we'll be looking at that from the standpoint of fire separation and so forth to make sure that we don't need to make too extra modifications to that wall and to the there's an opening now that it would become a doorway. Um, as far as the kitchen goes, the commercial kitchen, the nature of the kitchen, um, the owner, the tenant will be putting that bill. 
So to bring to bring the kitchen up doesn't impact the owner. It's the tenant who's willing to move in there that would be that would be paying the expenses to create that that commercial kitchen in there. And then you have two um, um, uh, needs for a significant amount of water if you think about a spot a restaurant. How much that back? Yes. Um, the I don't. I do not at this at this point. I only anticipate um, uh, water supply, city water supply, to be significantly impacted um, because it was once a spa. Um, there's a hundred gallon water heater in the in the cellar, so there are not that that would be functional for everybody, but there there is enough to have been supported um, the old Millennium Spa in the past. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I thought you had a question. Oh, I was going to, um, before we move further, do we need to take care of speaker and then public comment if there aren't any other discussion or questions? I, I was checking with the board <laughs> to see if anyone else had questions, but yeah, and now I was going to move to the public comment. I'm good. You're the public. All right. All right, uh, Mr. Donovan, if you don't mind, the portion of the review where we're where is open to public comment on your application, you're going to have the opportunity to come back and speak to any issues that are raised during the public comment. So, all right, that works for you. Thank you very much. All right, and so I'm going to ask is there anyone here in the room that would like to speak? in favor of the application? Is there anyone participating remotely that would like to speak in favor of the application? Okay. Is there anyone here in the room that would like to speak against this application? All right, and finally, is there anyone participating remotely that would like to speak against this application? Okay, hearing nothing, I'm going to close the public comment portion. And I believe we can now move forward with the secret. Mr. Chairman, uh, in regard to PLZBA 2024-0014, as supported by the staff reports, I ask that uh, uh, the board find this proposal to be an unlisted secret action with sufficient information available. Someone like to second. Second. We have a secret, we have a second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Here we go. Taking care of the secret. And so at this point, if there's no further discussion among the board, would someone like to make a motion regarding this application for a use variance at 2412-15? I would like to make a motion that we approve this use variance contingent upon site plan approval from the planning commission. Um, I believe that the applicant has demonstrated <clears throat> that um, there's uh, sufficient financial evidence to uh, support this use variant. Um, there is not, uh, there's uniqueness to the property being between a residential and Music Street commercial corridor. Um, that there is not hardship on the neighborhood by granting this use variant. Um, with the change in zoning, um, there is an argument to be made that this hardship is not self created. Um, and um, it will not substantially alter the character of the neighborhood, especially with um, the property being brought into co-compliance um, through the site plan approval process from the planning. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Jack, second, first. <laughs> Mr. Donovan, I'm going to go back to you quickly before we vote on this. Does, um, does the motion come forth with your understanding of what was discussed in the, the prior portion. Yes. 
of our review. It does. And you can we accept that. that, yes. Thank you. Angie, if you don't mind, could you uh, hold the roll on the vote, please? We have a motion to approve the application. On the motion to approve the lease there, if it on this time we would, I vote yes to approve. John Normal? I vote yes to approve. Stevie Minor? Yes. Lady Lee Lefton? Yes to approve. Dan McCann? Yes to approve. We have uh, unanimous approval for your application as uh, stipulated with conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> One, we're going to move on to our uh, our second piece of new business. This is PL DPA two zero two four zero zero one five. The property is uh, four fifty and four fifty two on this end. We have an application for a use variance. The applicant. I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce your name. Our applicant is Manager Shin Pala, and you're working on behalf of William Fadette. All right, and um, if I'll introduce if you, if you please introduce yourself and um, tell us where you live. My name is uh, Jim Conroy. I live at 125 2nd Street in Troy. I'm a commercial real estate broker with uh, Berkshire Hathaway Blake Realty, and I'm actually representing uh, the Fredette uh, Family Trust in this transaction. Um, and uh, this property is uh, currently, if you're at all familiar with it, it's currently uh, the headquarters of Fredette Painting. Um, the Fredettes have owned this building since the late 1970s. They have run their um, painting operation, contracting painting firm out of the building for all those years since. Uh, the building had also at one time housed a retail paint and wallpaper store and a garage to the rear of the property was at one time uh, independently owned and operated, excuse me, independently operated as a automotive uh, repair garage. <coughs> The um, Burdettes, uh have uh, made decisions with this property on the market, and uh, it has been on the market now for 40 months, a very uh, extended period of time, given the kind of property it is, a commercial one-story building suitable for a variety of uses. Um, but at the same time, it has suffered uh, from condition, location, various factors. The fact that it's a, a flag lot, uh, and it's very difficult to, to get access on the backside for their intended purposes through the alley. Um, so the property is now listed at $215,000. That is considerably less than we, you'll find in other similar properties of this size and use. In the capital district multiple listing service. Uh, I did a very quick survey of properties that have sold in Troy over the last two years. And the average sales price of those properties was over $370,000. I also further looked to find out whether or not there were any existing properties on the market that were similar in size and scope. Uh, and those prices were roughly $400,000. So you can see that this property is already uh, by factor of its location, its use, et cetera, et cetera, has had a, a considerable depreciation in, versus other properties of this size in the market. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Carell uh, Meninger, <coughs> excuse me, um, has found the building and it suits his needs. Uh, and they've come to the negotiation to purchase the property. So uh, Menender is the, uh, I guess, the purchaser for the need uh, for, uh, for the building. Um, the, his use is going to be 
as benign as you can possibly imagine, uh, given what else is allowed within the W-2 business classification. Um, his business is that of a small distribution site where he will acquire um, materials that is then distributed to convenience markets and gas stations throughout the capital district. I'll leave the further explanation of his business to him, but when you contrast the kind of use that he has proposed to the kind of uses that are allowed within this zone classification, there's no question that the intensity of the land use is substantially less than what would be uh, allowed, such as uh, cultural and community centers, child care and daycare facilities, medical offices and trade schools, bars, banquet facilities, brew pubs, and restaurants, cannabis dispensary and retail sales, dry cleaning and grocery stores, light industrial uses for reuse of an existing structure, and variety stores or hookup establishments. Um, all of these are allowed uses within this district. And this district is a bit unusual to be zoned the W-2 classification. There are two commercial properties that face Fifth Avenue in this location between 111th and 112. One is the Fredette building that we're talking about this evening. The other one is a former bar that has recently been closed due to shooting. Um, the predominant use on this street are two-story residential structures, almost completely until you get to the corner of 112th Street. So the predominant use in this neighborhood is that of a two-story residential. Um, it virtually makes this building not only a uh, non-conforming structure, but a very difficult building almost to, uh, I would say, um, obsolescence of, of the, uh, the building in this neighborhood. So uh, as I restate, the property has been on the market for 40 months. In that 40 month period, we have only had three interested parties move it toward a contract stage. The first applicant, was then unable to uh, get financing. The second applicant was unable to reach terms with the, with the owner, therefore it was done. The third in this 40 month duration, Mr. Carl, in his application. So I really asked the board to use your view of what really practical for this building and for this uh, site and recognize that Mr. Carl was used is probably the least offensive um, that the property could be put to ask for your consideration. Now, as far as, as far as the operation of this business, I'd like Mr. Carla to address that. Before, um, apologies, I'm sorry to cut you off. When I, <laughs> when I drove by the property, I didn't go down the alley. So I, while you were talking, I was trying to look at it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, on Google Maps. Uh, Mr. Conrad, there was something you said about alley access. I think I saw up, there's a roll up door. That's right. There is an alley there, and it is currently used uh, to deliver product to the paint business. Okay. So, so there, and there is a drive through capacity too. So the garage actually has a door that opens in the front and one that opens in the rear and allows a car or a small vehicle to drive through the garage and have access to the good side. I wasn't I wasn't going to jump ahead to this, but I was going to ask about whether you brought it up. Um, what sort of vehicles are we talking about accessing the warehouse? Are we talking about I'll let Mr. Carlos this point? Thank you. I love you. I think okay the bikes I have a small van. Actually, there are two or three people you know, together. But, you know, so I have a small distribution business around part of the Detroit data. And uh, usually I get orders from customers, from convenience stores, gas stations. You know, and then next day, we deliver. We have seven million orders pretty much daily. You know. 
and then next day, like two or three o'clock, my delivery we are told there to deliver. So like once a week or twice a week, my delivery comes from the wholesaler and like it comes on fire and come out. And I can use your fifth avenue or I can use any I think the fifth avenue that's way for me. And uh, that's about it in the business. And I believe the deliveries are made in panel trucks. They're not yeah, in any long in that. It's not an 18 wheeler kind of operation. Understood. I'm not, my concern is if, if, if the use is approved as a, as a warehouse or a wholesale distribution facility, and if your, your business takes off, you're incredibly successful, and you decide to move on somewhere bigger and better, the, the variance stays with the property. Someone else can move right in and you know maybe they're not working with with panel trucks and, and vans. So that's just something that the board has to do. So thank you. That's okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's understood. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I do mention though, the business, the building, the facility itself uh, is limited in um, in that regard, and, and it's marketability. You're not going to have a very large distribution center locate at that structure, simply because of its size, its configuration, and and its access. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see that, that either the roll-up door in the alley or the door at the front of the building, I can't really tell. That's an overhead door as well. Overhead roll of door. Is there a, a, a loading dock? No. no. So you can drive right through on grade. That's right. So it, 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 it's slightly, it's slightly an uphill at the rear end. There's a, an elevation difference of maybe two or three feet. Okay. But there's ramps. No one's going to back a tractor trailer down down that alley to, to get to a loading dock. No. I've talked a lot. I'm going to um, throw it to the rest of the board. Someone else has questions for the applicant? I have no questions. There's no manufacturing here. No, no. On it. It's a warehouse district. Yeah, it's a warehouse district. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is, Mr. Conroy, that uh, these are just going to be this distribution center as a wholesaler. Delivering uh, products to different stores. Yes. Right? We're not talking anything larger than a van. That's correct. No big panel trucks, none of that, right? Panel trucks will make the delivery to the building. Okay. However, that, however, I mean, distribution would be done by van. And the and word product, the word three person, yeah, they would like to have it for me and my body. All right. And the, and, the building, as I understood it, is still being used a little bit, but a lot of that building is not being used for months and months and months. We all know we have a building decay problem in this city, and I don't want to see that ever happen. But uh, that was my question, that if this isn't going to turn into anything other than mm -hmm. what you're going to do. Something. Correct. Thank you, sir. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question in regards to the reference that uh, Jack mentioned about decay. What uh, um, uh, renovations do you foresee needed uh, in that facility to use it for the purposes that you intend? There are. There will be some removal of internal walls and open it up so that it's more uh, linear or more open. Uh, these are, uh, the only plans for uh, renovation have to do with removing some interior walls, interior non-load bearing walls to make the space more open uh, for stacking shelves, etc. cetera. Um, there's no plan expansion, no plan uh, exterior modifications whatsoever. Uh, it may be a change in sign simply to change the uh, uh, 
fact that his business is there and the Burnett business has been heavy on. That's about the only uh, change you'll see to the exterior of the building. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, if it, they were manufacturing something here, it'd be light industrial and it'd be a permitted use. So I just want to make that point. <laughs> um, it's because of distribution. Uh, and the question I have, because there is adjacent residential uses, is, is what do you expect the hours of these deliveries to be? Um, yeah, we have a few, we have a few, and I don't know, I believe we could go like two o'clock, you know, and then my wife, my friend, sometimes, I don't know, so, and we park for him. So you don't have deliveries arriving at this facility earlier than you know seven a.m. No, I would be that they would come from three, like two o'clock, one o'clock. Yeah, in the afternoon. Yeah. In the afternoon. Okay. That was my one concern with hours of operation. Okay. At this point, I don't think there are any more questions Thank you. from the board. Thank you. Of course, uh, I'm going to ask you that. Yes, uh, I'm done. done. We'll be here. <laughs> We're just done with this board. I'm going to throw it open to public comment. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, hang out until, uh, until we've heard it. And then if there are any other concerns. We're here. I think. Uh, we're here. And so, at, at this point, is there anyone here in the room to speak in favor of this application? If you would, sir, please step up and uh, introduce yourself, tell us where you live, and use the mic. Ryan Brazen, I live on 225 6th Ave. Okay. Uh, I got the city councilor for the area right there. I got a bunch of questions from a bunch of constituents living right in that area. You guys asked all of it. Yeah, had perfect question or the perfect answers to your questions. But yeah, I'd love to see the thing. Okay. Well, thank thank you. you. Can we ask? What were the questions from your constituents that we got answered? <laughs> so the main one I heard was, is it going to be a marijuana distribution, which is not this property? Uh, what kind of trucks will be coming in and out? Um, are they going to do major renovations and the hours of operation? 7 a.m. a little early, but I think we yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there's no one else here in the room. Is there anyone participating remotely who would like to speak in favor of the application? And, and I'm going to ask, is there anyone participating remotely that would like to speak against the application? Okay, and so at this point, I'm going to close the, the public comment in regards to this application. I'll turn to the board. Last opportunity. Any further questions or concerns to be addressed by the applicant? You all. And so um, it's time to move on to the secret. Mr. Chairman, uh, in regard to uh, PLZBA 2024-0015, as supported by the staff reports, I ask that the board find this proposal to be an unlisted secret action with sufficient information available. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed say no. There you are. Take care of the secret. And so I'll uh, open it up to the members of the board. If anyone would like to make a motion in regards to the application for a variance to cap the forest. Jack McCann can make the motion to approve. Uh, I foresee this as uh, something that's needed action there. And I can where I have years of. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
pay that bill, and that's why he just got in the price that he got to compare that to the other similar building, one of 150 to 200 thousand dollars that the big thing people aren't going to get purchased that building. It'll just sit there and rot. We all know what will happen. My my idea here is I would just go to a group. All right, Mr. McCann, is it safe to say that you feel that uh, the applicant cannot achieve a reasonable return? Provided that, that lack of return is substantial, as demonstrated by competent financial evidence? Yes. Or the pretext for that. Okay. Would you say that the alleged hardship of the property is unique and does not apply to a substantial portion of the district or neighborhood? Okay. Would you say that the requested use variance if granted will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood? And finally, would you say that the alleged hardship is not self created? No, it would. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Would anyone like to second motion? I would second. We have a motion, and the motion has been seconded. Angie, if you don't mind, could you pull the roll on the vote, please? Yeah. Oh, apologies. Discussion. Apologies. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, to your point, earlier point, John, that this carries forward with the property, I understand the applicant has indicated the hours of operation. I asked the question, I want the discussion of, should we have the, con the condition of an hours of operation, or is there something in the code that already exists that restricts their hours of operation? Just keeping in mind the residential uses that are on that, that block, adjacent to the property. So I do not know off the top of my head if there's something in the code that sets forth the hours. Most likely not. Mm -hmm. um, you could make it a condition if you feel it's necessary, but I would caution to be conservative and not too restrictive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, I mean, I think within reason you can, but you can't say, like, you know, you only have five hours a day. Or <laughs> just you just know, on that point, I, I don't think the condition is necessary because the prior use for the paint uh, uh, company, uh, I'm sure that the frequency of uh, and, and timing is probably as much or likely much more, was much more frequent. And it was a application. So I, I think it's actually improved uh, or decreased it previously. I, I think what's being proposed is, but it just the use of a warehouse or distribution tends to be evening hours, even though that's what the applicant doesn't intend to do. That's why I bring it up because it's, so, it's not in relation to this exact. Not that this will necessarily negate the issue, but with the use variance, it doesn't necessarily run with the land if it went immediately within one year from warehouse to warehouse, then the use variance would stay with it and the new person wouldn't have to come back. But if there's a gap of a year or more, right. then they do have to come back. Um, so it's different from an area variance in that regard. It, it runs with the property to a certain So I believe the question before the board is the necessity first to, to restrict the hour or to add a qualifier to our approval that would restrict the hours of operation. And it sounds like, I, I don't recall the exact hour one I heard at, at the, so it would be until 7 p.m. Absolutely. Sorry, <laughs> Actually, my operations is nine to seven maximum. So we are not. I'm old enough. I can't work hard. So like eight, nine o'clock. So that seven o'clock. Nine to Yes, it's nine to seven. You can get sometimes week up, especially Friday, even Saturday, Sunday is half day, Sunday is close, you know, Saturday is a half day. And Friday would be like that. Okay, so yeah. you, I'm hearing that you would accept a condition on the approval related to the hours of operation being limited 
from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Yeah, actually, I don't want you to put a condition, but I'm saying to you, you know, not saying anything at all. What it's, he's saying is that that's his intended use. He prefers not to have a condition, yeah. but he's letting you know what his intended This word still can, if you feel it necessary, you put that condition on. But again, I mean, from my from a legal perspective, even hearing that, like, I think it needs to go outside of nine to seven because there may be a need to come in early before something. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if it's seven a.m. to nine p.m. or something, then that's a little bit more broad and reasonable, and not during you know, nighttime hours when people are sleeping. But I think, you know, Lindsay made a point, he, he, <clears throat> you know, has a different opinion on that. So I think there needs to be a little bit more further discussion to determine if there needs to be a motion to amend or if you're going to keep the movement on the table. But, All right. Thank you. So I, I don't think we have to make the motion yet to amend. I think you, I, I just, I put a stake in the ground at 9 a.m., 7 p.m. seems more reasonable. 7 a.m. 9 p.m. I'm not I'm not trying to know of this but if I could speak this property has been vacant for approximately 40 months no no sir uh it is I'm sorry uh, it's a concurrent operation with uh, Fredettes. They own it and they are using the building uh, as we speak today. Uh, they will be relocating uh, once the sale is complete. But they but do operate. But you mention during a 40 month period of time? Yes, it's been for sale. It's been for sale. For 40, okay. for 40 months. Here's and we've my, gotten free, gotten free off. Here's my concern. I'd like to go back to what Mr. McCann said about buildings being allowed to be vacant, dormant, and run down. If they've been trying to sell this building for 40 months, and they have a qualified buyer, I would rather not see you restrict the hours of operation for the buyer. It's his business. It's his money. It's his opportunity, and I think the more business we can get in Troy, the more taxes we can have on the rolls, and the more buildings we can have occupied should be our main focus. I would not hamstring this property with restrictive hours. He's got a freedom of opportunity. I would approve it without conditions. Along the lines of what uh, Mr. Miner actually was uh, brought up, um, can you tell me, uh, Mr. Kilroy, uh, um, the current operations, uh, since it wasn't vacant for 40 months, it's just been lifted, what are the uh, frequency and hours of those current operations? They vary. Um, there are occasions where they're actually conducting work inside the building to prepare for painting contracts outside. So it, it's a very, um, most of the hours, most 99% of their day, they're out of there by four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, however, there are occasions where they might use the building over the weekend or late at night to prepare materials for their uh, next day work or installation. I'm afraid I don't know specifically how many, how often that's done. But they, they do make um, use of the building at odd hours, what we would consider odd hours, but only very, very occasionally, very, very rarely, actually. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Miner, you know, to respond to some of the constituent concerns that, that Ryan has brought forward that we asked about, um, I would propose an amendment that we restrict deliveries to the building and those trucks that are larger to the hours of 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. That would still allow operations, employees to be in the building, um, but restrict loud beeping of trucks backing up and you know those larger trucks delivering to the site to really the hour of 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. So can, can we make uh, a condition that specific? Yes, 
Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Could, could we vote separately on whether or not to add a condition? Yes. So what happens at this point is Lindsay has made a motion to amend. John will next ask if there's a second, and then there will be a vote on the amended on the amendment as proposed. If that gets if that goes forward, then that will become the new motion with the grant with the condition. If that does not pass. Then it would just go back to the motion to grant the use variance. But so there's two separate votes one on the amendment, and then the second either on the motion to grant or the motion to grant as a method, depending on the outcome of the So we need a second. <laughs> we'll go ahead and go there. All right. Any other questions at this point? Let's come over for a second. So are no questions. So we have a motion to approve, but we have also, before we address that, we have a motion to amend <coughs> Mr. McCann's motion to approve. Do we have a second for that? Wait, there, there is a motion to grant by McCann, there is a second by Mr. Minor. Correct. So now there's been a motion to amend Jack's. By the name of the piece, you know there needs to be a second on that. Right. right. Okay. I misunderstood what you were saying. Sorry. At this point, I've not heard a second on the motion to amend. Uh, this is this is a delivery hour of the right? This hour is a delivery. Uh, what I'm what I'm proposing is that the condition is deliveries, panel trucks and larger. Um, be restricted to the hours of 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, yeah, 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 but it's not hours it. of operation. You know, the build, the business can okay. operate yeah. outside of its hours, but it's still literally right. 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. I'll second that. Okay. So we have motion to amend the motion to approve. Angie, if you don't mind, can you call the roll on the motion to amend Mr. McCann's motion to approve? Uh, the, uh, on the motion to amend Jack McCann's uh, initial motion, how would you vote? No. Do I know how? I vote no. Stephen Minor? No. Lindsay Zepson? Yeah. Yes. So the motion to amend, the motion to approve, has been defeated <laughs> three to two. So now the motion to grant right. by Mr. McCann is on the table. Well, and there's been a second for this. We do have a motion on the table. Is there any reason for any further discussion? Okay, and so we have a motion before before the board to approve the uh, requested use variance without restriction. And once once again, perhaps for the last one, would you call the roll, please? On the roll, uh, the motion to approve uh, the use variance without without uh, any amendment. If you done this, how we would? I vote yes to approve an unrestricted, uh, the unrestricted motion. Do I know? I vote yes to approve. Stephen Minor? Yes to approve. Lindsay Zepkin? Yes to approve. Don't know. Dr. Yes, again? Yes to approve. There you have it. Um, so the use variant application has been approved. We wish you success. Okay. Thank you. But, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I'm going to thank you all for your patience and for your service for Fine City. At this point, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. We don't have it. We have a motion to adjourn. We have a second. All favor say aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.